you've been around film long enough to know that sometimes things work out and sometimes they don't work out. With that career-spanning right. perspective in mind, how did Legend work out? Um, I thought it worked out very well. I thought we attempted something that was pretty tricky to do tone-wise, and I thought we pulled it off, and I'm, I'm very proud of it. And there are plenty of American gangsters who are yet to have their stories told. So what was it that fascinated you, an American, about these British criminals? Well, you know, I actually I thought that they were quite similar to uh, American gangsters in a way, which is what makes them, I think, a little different for the British. I think it's part of the British fascination with them is that they're different than, their, than the usual British gangsters. But to, to my eyes, they're very much like American gangsters. The fact that their brothers goes right in with the American family mafia. And London in the 60s is very much like Las Vegas in the, in the 50s and 60s, which was a American mafia playground, really. And I didn't see them as other. I, I saw them very much as fitting into American gangster sensibilities a lot of the time. I was going to ask you if you thought there was a real difference, essentially, between British and American crims. Yeah, yeah. I think... In the, for British, their movies, their crime movies are often about the crime itself and their, the heist and the job and the great train robbery, how they go about it. And American mafia movies are much more about the relationships between the mobsters and in some ways the American dream kind of gone haywire, which also the craze kind of fit into that with their rags to riches rise from the poverty of the East End after the war and all those things. But yeah, I think uh, British crime films are much more interested in the crime itself, and, and Americans don't really care so much about the crime. Now, Brian, I've got to ask you about two British crime films. I'm betting that you're a fan of The Long Good Friday, and I'm also keen to know sure. what you thought of the 1990 movie, The Craze. You know, I, I liked The Long Good Friday a lot, and uh, one of my advisors on the film was a British gangster named Freddie Foreman, and a lot of people say The Long Good Friday is very much based on his life. But the film The Craze, I, I saw when it first came out many years ago, whenever that was, 25 years ago, and hadn't seen it since it came out. And I always remembered liking it when I first saw it. I made a point of not seeing it again until I was done with the film. And when I was all done with the film, I watched it again. And I was very, you know, I was actually very happy to see that there was room for a lot of ground that we covered isn't covered in that movie and vice versa. So I think there's there's plenty of stuff about the craze to tell and go around. And if someone five years from now wanted to make a craze film, I think they could easily find their own version of it that wouldn't be beholden to mine or that one. As a writer, I'm very keen to know what the benefit was of telling the story from the female point of view through Francis, played by Emily Browning. Yeah, well, I think it's it's a, exactly that. It's a it's a way to see the the boys from a different point of view and from a woman's point of view and to see a side of them that you couldn't see it was just the two of them rumbling around knocking people on the top of the head and it just was a it just gave me a chance to to see them in a different light and to tell the story from a different angle than it, it's it's ever really usually told from can i just quickly ask you about emily browning because you have a lot of very capable british actresses how did you wind up using an Australian actress? I've worked with a lot of Australians over the years, either on films I directed or, or films that I wrote where they were cast. You know, I actually think almost more than half the movies I've ever done have had Australians in them. You have very good taste. Yeah, yeah, and they're great, and they're, and, uh, they're so kind of natural, and they don't feel like they're a product of Hollywood all those great things. But Emily, I wasn't searching for an Australian, though. I was just waiting for, for Francis, the character, to walk through the door. And when Emily came in, she was Francis. And she had a very, um, she had a kind of great innocence, but, but, but she wasn't a fool, you know, as far as the innocence went. And a great way about her that I thought, from what I had learned about Francis, lined up with, with Francis in, in a lot of ways. So, and she was great. She was, Emily was always two takes and we were done because she had just nailed it every time. And she has, to, she has a very tough job because it's a quieter role. Tom obviously has all the kind of flash in the film, both, both on both sides, Reggie and Ron. And all Emily's scenes are either with Reggie or Ron. And so she has to, you know, with all that kind of praise that Tom's getting, she has to match that and, and, and not wilt away from it, which she doesn't. She's, she's, she holds her own with both brothers, and I, I think it's 
the kind of glue that holds the movie together. The issue of glamorizing criminals is always a cliched concern when it comes to crime movies. But surely you could not have done this story justice without showing the glamour. The fact that these guys loved being celebrity crooks. Right. Well, I mean, it might be unpopular to say, but the Crays were glamorous. I didn't, I didn't make them glamorous in the film. They were glamorous. They ran nightclubs where famous people, whether they were actors or boxers or singers, flocked to these clubs and clamored to be around them. There's endless photos of Reggie and Ron with celebrities. And so they were, they were glamorous. I'm not making... I'm not the one that's making them glamorous. They were glamorous themselves, which I think is interesting because it's why why are criminals glamorous, you know? And I think it's because they live a life that, that other people wish they could live, although they, they pay a heavy price for it. And that's the, that price is what probably keeps a lot of people from heading down that road. But the other thing is, is, is glamorous isn't necessarily a good thing. You know, you're not... Being glamorous doesn't make you good. It just means you're glamorous. You're also hitting on an important point that when you deal with career criminals, you have to show why they're choosing that lifestyle over a legitimate lifestyle. Yeah, and I think in Britain with the class system and all those things and these two kids born in the East End and bombed out neighborhoods from the war, their options in life are narrow. You know, they're not they're not going to get jobs on the stock exchange and, and, and things like that. And crime and sports are a couple of options open to these guys if they want to achieve something, especially in, in those days. But uh, otherwise, it's, they're, they're kind of in for a life of hard work, which, which is nothing wrong with that, but it's not what they wanted. And they, they you know, it's that kind of thing. It's like, you're, what do you do when you find out your great talent in life is, is being a criminal? So... You know, they pursued it in their case. Why do right-thinking, law-abiding citizens love watching films about gangsters? Is there an element of prurient admiration, even envy? Yeah, I think all those things, I think. But I think na they're natural movie characters also. Like, why do people, not so much anymore, but why do they want to go see westerns? Or why do they want to see cop movies? Or why do they want to see movies about pirates? You know, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a larger-than-life life that, that most people only ever read about or hear about and um, to, uh, one of the great things about the movies is you can go and escape into a world and, and I think the world of crime and criminals is one of those worlds endlessly fascinating you know Dickens wrote about Fagin and Bill Sykes and those guys and, and people were completely fascinated with them N name the good people in in uh, Oliver Twist you know <laughs> besides <laughs> Oliver everyone remembers the criminals so it's I don't know if I have an answer as to why, but it's certainly something that's existed a long time. Now, Tom Hardy People remember Jack the Ripper. They don't. They don't remember the cops that chased after him. Now, Tom Hardy is outstanding in this film. To what extent did you elicit the performance from him, and to what extent was he kind of already there waiting for you? Yeah, I think Tom. He was very much w waiting there. The truth is, is he, if I had just said, I want you to play Reggie Cray, he could have done a, a fantastic job playing just Reggie opposite someone else. And if I said, I want you to play Ron, he could have done a fantastic job playing Ron because he's a, he's a chameleon. Um, I think the part of Ron was always more interesting to him because Reggie is more of a straight man. So what I really got that people haven't seen before, I think is Tom is a straight straight ahead movie star as far as Reggie goes but I didn't you know my it's like being in charge of the circus you don't teach the knife thrower how to throw knives <laughs> you know he knows how to throw them you just he might say a little to the left or a little to the right but Tom knows how to throw his knives and he doesn't he doesn't need me telling him how to do it can you tell me about one moment in the movie where you're looking at it and you think to yourself this is a great piece of cinema and I have no idea where it came from and it's my movie the you know, I think when the brothers are on the ground after their fight and Ron has them in an embrace, and I, I find that scene to have a, a very strong emotion to it. But when we were shooting it, it's Tom with his stuntman on top of his stuntman, and then it's Tom with his stuntman on top of him. And all very disjointed. You had no sense of how it was going to play. 
until it was cut together. And so, you know, it was a very important emotional scene between the brothers and, and really the only emotional scene between the brothers. And standing there doing it, it was, it was just we were adrift almost. And then when it was, I remember going to the editing room after a couple of days after I shot it to see it. And um, it, it had just cut together really well. And I was, it was kind of stunning. How would you say that you reframe the meaning of violence in legend, say, as opposed to the way you used it in Mystic River, which I still think is one of Clint Eastwood's very best films? In Mystic River, it seems to be this unstoppable, inevitable force that occurs, whereas with legend, while you certainly have moments of psychopathic outbursts, it's also kind of used as a business tool. Yeah, no, I think the... um Mystic River, it's, it's the violent act at the start of the film that rules the film, that everything happens, happens because of the violent act at the beginning of the film. And, and really, in legend, it's all leading to the violent act at the end of the film. So the violence can be almost more enjoyable at the start. You see hoodlums getting, you know, roughed up, and you see the craze outnumbered by another gang taking care of them. So it's a kind of violence that, that you in, enjoy, for lack of a better word, movie violence. But, but the idea was to strip that away from it as the movie went on. So the violence in the second half and then the final violence, which is uh, Reggie stabbing Jack the Hat McVitty to death, really land as, as, as horrible things. So there's definitely a, sh a shape to it and how it's treated. But I, I, I would say it's at the beginning of Mystic River and it's, it's, it hits home at the end of Legend. You deserve huge congratulations for your use of tracking shots in Legend. They're notoriously hard to do. Yeah, well, the, the big one is in the club when, on their first date. And what we always thought, what I always thought was Reggie was... Ron was very upfront and honest. He never lied about what he was doing or who he was. It's what, you, what you saw is what you get with Ron. But Reggie was different to everyone he came across. He was different to his guys. He was different to his brother. He was different to Francis. And I thought that if we could do a one-shot track on him going through that club, and, and, and he's one thing to the doorman, and he's another thing to the people that greet him as he walks in, and then he... He's something else to her, and then he gets pulled to the back of the club where he has to deal with some business and then come back out again to be with her again and be romantic again. I thought if we could do all that in one and see Tom go through all those changes without a cut, it, it would be a very strong way of, uh, of showing who Reggie was and what his world that he was living in was. It, so it seemed very motivated to me. Is it a bit of a showbiz legend that you keep your Oscar for LA Confidential and your Razzie for the Postman side by side as sort of as a sort of yin yang Zen type reminder of the vicissitudes of the business? Yeah, no, I, I, um, they, they're right next to each other, about <laughs> I don't know, seven feet off the ground, and uh, I had to fight to get my Razzie. They, they had given it to me, but they didn't have one to give, so I had to make them. They had to make one for me because they only have the one that they tried out for the their presentation but yeah hey hey, the, uh, hey brian helgeland was the postman really that bad i mean it's an okay movie you know, i don't especially the, the when postman, you're on tv it, it unwinds okay it's a good movie yeah it's kevin costner was sort of you know headed towards a bad place for whatever reason with his peel at the time and i think the movie took a beating for it that it's not a great you know it's a it's not a great movie i think it's got a, it's a decent movie but i think it it suffered for a lot of things that have nothing to do with the movie, which I don't really know how to explain. It's just bad timing for him and bad timing for the movie. You know that press conference where that LGBT reporter clumsily asks Tom Hardy about his sexuality? In the footage, right. in the footage you're clearly laughing as Tom Hardy is asked the question, have you worked out what on earth that reporter was on about? Yeah, you know, it was a very... It was a very confused question, and I'm probably, if I'm laughing, I'm laughing because as, as Tom quizzes him, he gets more and more confused as it goes along to, to the point of almost getting absurd. But, you know, I don't know. It, it wasn't, we were up there to talk about the movie, and it's not like a press con it's not like the press conference at the White House where they're talking about some national security issue or something. And, um, you know, I don't know if, if Tom's expecting, he's, up there expecting questions about the film he just worked really hard on and, and, and uh, that's 
that was the place for those kind of questions. Classic gangster films. Do you have a favorite two or three that you consider to be great examples of gangster films? You know, I it's going to sound strange. I really like The French Connection because he, Gene Hackman's like a gangster in that film. He's a gangster cop in that film. And uh, it's all about, uh, he's, he's not mad about heroin. He's just mad that the guy's waved at him on the train and is disrespectful to him. And I, I think that's one of the great gangster characters in film is Gene Hackman in the in the French Connection, in a, in a way. Other than that, I, you know, I, I mean, the first Godfather is un, unbeatable. I know it's I know it's a cliche to say it, but it's just unbeatable. That journey of that, you know, the son, the one son, the guy wants to keep out of the business, is turns out to be the one who's the most suited for it. You know, it's, it doesn't get any it doesn't get any better than that. I'd be if I said another movie than that, I'd be just trying to sound more discerning than I am. I'm just eager to know what you think of the filmmaking firmament at the moment given the fact that we get some 200 million dollar chewing gum movie every week or every second week yet, <laughs> <laughs> yet at the well, same yet. you know those, those those big superhero movies are fine but it does make it harder for for smaller movies and and it does educate an audience every audience every generation is educated at a certain stage by what they what they get fed really and i don't yeah i don't know i don't i think they're great fun and everything but when it ends up being all that anyone's concentrating on it it uh it leaves a, a much narrower world for every everybody else trying to do something. So, but you know, they everything comes and goes. So, ten years from now, will be uh, there'll be some other kind of movie out there. But <laughs> I don't. I think they're fun. I don't think they're healthy. 